Hi folks, this is Kat Sheridan here from the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. Um, really pleased today to share with you uh, our artist who's going to, to talk about her process and um, artwork, Gloria Ann Shows. Now I don't wanna steal any kind of thunder um, but a little bit of housekeeping for you as we go through the presentation. If you have any questions, please put them into the comments. Um, if we're not able to get to them by the end, I know the artist will be more than happy to follow up with you and get those answers to you. Uh, thank you for joining us and let's get started. Um, let's see, I, it says I can't start my video. Is that, Ooh. okay, there we go. All right, good, all right. Hello, and thank you, Kat, for the introduction. Thank you, Erica Hess, for curating this show and Rife Gallery for inviting you or inviting me to share with you all a bit about my work. I'm honored by the opportunity to be in your space and among so many outstanding artists. And thank you all for being here and thank you for your interest. My name is Gloria Ann Shows. Uh, I'm an artist and lecturer based here in Columbus, Ohio, although not originally from here. I moved here for graduate school and have been seeking communities here and beyond ever since. My background plays a large part in the conceptual decisions I make. And because of this, I'd like to give you some insight. My original home and birthplace is Angeli City in the Philippines, which is home of former Clark Air Force Base where my father was stationed for a short while and where he met my mother. I grew up with stories of my family's swift evacuation from the second largest volcanic eruption of this century, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. The stories of this volcanic eruption molded my early perceptions of home. And our hasty escape was the result of what I understood at the time as luck. It hadn't occurred to me until late in my adolescence, my advantaged position as an evacuee and the livelihoods that had no choice but to stay behind. This is a postcard of it at its least horrific. And there were stories of island hopping until we landed in New Mexico, where my sister was born shortly after and where my father waited for his next assignment. I hold no memories there. My earliest memories, however, were in my formative years in Japan and in primary school until I was nine years old. It hadn't occurred to me until the time that I had moved away from Japan that this was not actually going to stay my home. And that was a temporary body in the first culture where I found myself embedded. My adolescent preteen years in England were a culture shock from my early childhood education. My parents pushed my sister and I to learn as much as we could from our host cultures. I found my greatest sense of belonging among the population of mixed children in Department of Defense schools who, like myself, had experienced rapid uprooting prior and introduced themselves with answers to where have you been uh, instead of where are you from. A minor difference was somehow significantly less impact, and perhaps it was the tone. I anticipated more mirrors to my experiences back then. Not unlike, my, unlike mine, I connected with others over shared identities as in-between bodies, ethnicities, and cultures. Tourists occupying space that didn't belong to us, part of a larger governing body who had carved out the space as their own. Being raised as multi-ethnic in a multicultural environment with an enduring sense of impermanence wasn't really an issue for about half my life. And by issue, I mean that my understanding of this way of life being peculiar or uncommon. Uprooting had become a fact of life for everyone I choose uh, to grow, grow close to. With a cycle between three and five years, we all shared this lack of rootedness. My dad enlisted to be uprooted and my mother left her home country of 21 years to return but once since then. Friendships had an expiration date and we had plenty of practice saying goodbye. 
And while I don't think this speaks much to the work that I make, it was the backdrop to experiences less comfortable to divulge with people my age back then and even now. I think often of native populations of people who, depending on their proximity to our sanctuary, were happy to welcome us or to spite us. I had an occasional reminder of paralleled visions of the United States to a place where I hadn't been in memory. I had never experienced this myself, but heard stories peppered in between our adolescent chats of host countries that were less than hospitable, that they don't like Americans, don't drink the tap water, they'll spit in it. My ignorance at the time exclaiming, but I'm not that, I'm not American. Following a post 9-11 uprooting to the United States, uncertainty of self became a fixation in the face of rekindled nationalistic perspectives. It wasn't until I landed in Oklahoma that it had sunk in. The reality of these relationships between countries and the chain of events which brought me here or there. I had begun my retreat inward to my newfound American but not Americanness. I had a rough time as I was adjusting to smaller communities of people who were unlike the kind I grew up with most of them born and raised together with history spanning their lifetime. I spent a lot of time thinking about this and the work I made back then reflected that. Oklahoma is where I started studying psychology and where I left with my BFA in fine art. And the art I made, it beckoned for an echo or people would share their own experiences to which I hoped were like mine. I spent a lot of time hoping for signals from other mixed kids or even Filipino Americans who would wallow with me in their lack of roots or confused sense of heritage. I moved to Ohio in 2016 with virtually no expectations except that maybe my chances for this connection would be greater. In graduate school, my work continued along this trajectory as I discovered less likelihood of this connection moving out to the quintessential Midwest. And I wonder often how much this might have meant for me had things been different. Was my move to Oklahoma a point in time that triggered this inquiry of who I am to others? Was it the political environment in a nation post trauma? Was it my shift from, from teen to young adults that put me in a state of inquiry beyond who am I to something like who am I to you and who am I here and who am I in relation with other people? And finally, who am I to this place? Nagandam is somewhere between sadness and longing. The content of my work has always been pulled from personal experiences, lived, remembered, re-remembered, filtered through adult eyes, and 10 plus years of physical distance. Many memories stand out to me as being largely inconsequential or mundane, but they do exist and I render them permanently to be consequently changed forever. It used to be fueled by an intense fear of forgetting, but in my hustle to remember, I found patterns of what memories stood out to me, the things that I didn't necessarily choose to remember, which have continued to inform how I frame myself around others and around the places that I've called home. I consider myself an image maker as I process most of my imagery through illustration and printmaking and where I often explore monotype and relief processes. In relief printmaking, I draw directly on wood or linoleum, scenes that I both remember from my formative years and scenes that I imagine deliberately or as a consequence of failing to remember. I also use screen printing and alternate print methods, but not as heavily. My preferred process is reductive, carving or otherwise removing material to produce a raised image. The raised surface is inked and pressed on paper or fabric, creating an image such as this many times over. The removal of the material uncovers an image and pressing paper into it produces not only an impression of what remains, but something called a bite, which is an embossment or what I view as a type of topography. Instead of one mirror, I have one whole edition to share. My work more often than not is figurative and when it's not figurative, it leans toward landscape. And when speaking about my work, I tend to bounce between first and third person due to my visual approach, 
which renders all people, including myself, as characters, and although autobiographical, in detached third person. I render information multiple times as a strategy for communicating ideas about self-consciousness, self-policing, and self-othering. The twinning is representative as a stand-in for the other, whether it's in the eyes of the present looking toward the past, or the eyes of someone there to witness or share the experience, or perhaps the inward looking eyes of revisiting a memory. The graphic imagery I use in is in reference to cartoons, which were a large part of the visual culture in my upbringing. I have always found in the simplicity of cartoonist figures an opportunity to project similarities into each character beyond what's expressed in their actions. In self-consciousness, I have often found myself in search of a mirror in the media that I consume. And I know that the memories I render are not as I remember them. And I'm aware of how the filter of time and adult eyes can color memories, both recent and distant. I print landscapes and their ghosts as a visual language centered around place and people. In landscape, I focus on islands and mountaintops locations that are difficult to access from my current position, either from a level of effort it would be required to travel or due to the imagined nature of these places. This reflects the distance between now and then, here and there. Between these landscapes are bodies of water, or in other cases, an atmospheric haze that separates people and the geological bodies. I play with scale between person and place. I render mountains as clods of dirt. I scale flora such as poppies and cherry blossoms, flowers symbolic to the respective cultures of England and Japan to confront figures or to exist as prominent features of an imagined or symbolic place. Although powerful cultural symbols, they've taken on a new symbolism with me as reminders of the temporary. The landscape orientation typically highlights the expansiveness of a place with the horizon line dividing visual space and separating sky from land. In landscapes, vertical stacking of space is associated with Eastern perspective. Early Eastern landscapes have historically rendered without a horizon line, and it was not until they were introduced to the cultural influence of the West that the horizon line became a dominant feature in their landscapes. A portrait orientation mirrors the position of the body that views it. This orientation is closed, framing subjects that typically assume a similar vertical orientation. I emulate the strategy of vertical stacking in perspective because of its ability to equalize place while balancing my own split background, which has historically rendered landscapes otherwise. Mark making in relief is one of the medium's primary methods of creating a sense of value. And I use this as a way of exploring within the binary of carved and uncarved, present and absent, touched and untouched, and it takes time. And I find that the repetitive motion of carving these marks is meditative. I ink the blocks with black ink, which makes the binary more apparent. In my black and white, I'm interested in the imbalanced values and the grays that were sent simulated by the very distribution of black and white. The process of relief printmaking always produces a mirrored image. I find that in printing, these images are finally revealed to me in a clear imprint of the image I spent so much time carving away. The process of carving a block produces something sculptural and there's always a translation of that sculptural object to paper. I gravitate the most towards processes that can be rendered at a portable scale, such as this, at an intimate size and with an optimized working distance similar to most desk work. In other words, I like to hover over my work so you don't see it happen. Despite this intimate scale, the work I make is a bit time consuming. This is great when I'm seeking long stretches of time to mentally churn. As my hands repeat short gestures, sometimes this isn't possible given other obligations. That being said, I've managed more immediate ways of making that still allow me an opportunity to mentally process while I physically process imagery. I find this way of making cathartic, the time consuming process of removing material affords me time 
to start with an impulse and fill in the blanks as I go. I always struggle with these blocks to go in with a plan as something always changes. The personal nature of my work is motivated into being from a desire to compose and communicate complicated feelings and experiences difficult to assign words. I'm sensitive to the ways that I relate to people and the spaces I occupy. I'm in search of an image that I could best articulate this relationship to place, an image that depicts many places far away that have become part of me. I start with figures and they act as vessels in which I project looping reflections. With enough of these loops, I find those patterns previously mentioned that are expressed to this day by myself and by those around me who may have shared experiences. These are patterns which at their root challenge my being and belonging here or there. This pattern was developed by early introductions to distinct Eastern and Western cultural landscapes and the inherent societal pressures to assimilate. Cultural gatekeepers, which reinforced the status of outsider and cited a long path in my questioning of belonging. And when I'm not printing, I'm making direct drawings. I play with flat materials for illustration and much of what I have to share here has informed the direction of my current work. This piece came from a gift. I was gifted a large stack of unlabeled paper. It was lightweight with the pulp of paper unevenly distributed, perhaps a handmade. Sometimes when paper this light gets printed on, it bleeds through the paper and what you could see on the other side is a bleed or gross a uh, ghost image. Perhaps this light is not ideal for printmaking because it may not survive multiple passes through a press or the accumulation of ink. Graphite is semi-transparent, it's temporary, it's water soluble, it can be erased, smudged, or wiped away. If it's in contact with other material, it can transfer at varying degrees. The tooth or texture of paper can make the process of erasure difficult. I bound the paper into a book. When I applied the powdered form of graphite into the, the gift paper, I brushed it in the shape of islands. I thought of the state of them as temporary, either growing or shrinking between levels of submersion, desaturated and unclear in their sense of time. These islands were solitary and paired, brushed on both sides of the paper. The production of these islands relied on my ability to remember what I had already rendered and to avoid repeating the past. I did this all to the sheets of paper with the intention of seeing a change brought by the transfer of graphite from surface to surface. Unintentionally, the influence of my memory had found a way to visually manifest. Not only did the images transfer from the shifting stack, but loose graphite had sifted through the layers, creating a haze or ghost of information on every page from the islands viewed before and after it. Simultaneous with my island book were drawings combined with monotype, exploring the physical separation and transparency of materials. In this collection of images, you see two layers, the top layer with figures and underneath that landscape. Two adolescent girls of similar features are illustrated with graphite on transparent matte duralar. Underneath each sheet of duralar are blue monotypes with silhouetted peaks of mountains and islands. The misty top layer dulls the saturated ink below it. The filter is suspended in front like a curtain to a window. And this is the first time that I played extensively with printed ghosts, a byproduct of the print process where I print with the residual ink from the plate after it's been printed. In these drawings, the placement of the figures are often broken up, shuffled, or repeated on the page to explore something like a nonlinear narrative or the way that memories loop and change through the act of remembering. The girls are often depicted looking outside the picture frame. Instead of verbal communication with each other, they participate in shared activities like watching television, painting their nails, washing their faces, receiving their first Eucharist, or playing in the dirt. Distance, both physical and emotional, is addressed through the modes of communication, such as photographs and telephone calls. A photograph of a distant family member's funeral refers to a once superficial understanding of familial loss. 
The girls were separated from each other once to communicate with an absent figure through the telephone. The rendering of the absent figures of Lolo and Lola as a phone signifies complications that physical separation can bring to the development of familial relationships and consequently heritage. I explored the home in these drawings as a temporary space, as part of a less temporary geological space, illustrating familiar fragments, which include a television, furniture, windows, and a sliding glass door. On a long roll of gridded paper, I collected and layered these drawn, in, drawn images, like rooms of a house, the rectangular sheets of Duralar, and prints on paper allocated space. Within each defined space was a collection of images which acted as fragments of the shared story. With paint, I traced parts of the story onto gridded paper. The white paint took the form of clouds or icy mountain peaks or the distance of memory as it fades in the form of a ghost or aura. It exists in the middle layer where it highlights layers above it and obstructs layers below it, three layers marking a persistent past. Growing up with uprooting cycles averaging every four years, I have come to know the time between three and five years occupying a place as time more turbulent. I measured the units of distance between myself and my friends in hours. I saw a timeline implied by the grid on the wall and responded with an accordion book. I could see that beyond all the layers of semi-transparent material, how imagery and materials persist and shine through. Printmaking processes produce an abundance of print material, and my conceptual process continuously brings me back to the past to reconcile the present. In combination with prints both finished and abandoned, I play with composition and framing often. Making fluid processes and monotype meet the carved mark of relief. How important is it to frame a figure in the context of a place if that place is defined as temporary? Can place frame place? I project, but what do you project? Can you project? Is it alien or inaccessible? Is it too abstract? The process of revisiting the past through illustration, mirroring, transferring, removing, printing, ghosting, and collaging all took me here to collaged monotypes. My monotypes usually exist on paper or fabric. A monotype, much like a painting, produces a single image, but instead of being painted directly on canvas, panel, linen, etc., it's applied to a non-porous surface like plexiglass. I paint ink on this plexiglass in a relatively thin application to be run through a press with dampened paper. Here I have a photo of that process and my feet for scale. The intense pressure of the press saturates the fibers of rice paper with an image. The image and paper become inseparable. Cultural values and traditions are reflected in the way that each culture represents place. My monotypes took the form of landscapes and the aesthetic decisions behind these landscapes are informed by the varied cross-cultural representations of landscape. When I make imagery of islands and mountains, I'm thinking of the thousands of islands that make up the Philippines. I'm thinking about the, the rich visual history that has many divergent contributions from the Philippines' long history of settlers and colonizers. Contributions from Spain, Indonesia, Malaysia, China, Japan, and the United States. From the remnants of each print, I respond to the remaining ink on my monotype plate with a new composition, either rendered into negative space, reinforcing information from the print before it, or responding to different forms entirely. My monotypes are printed on the front back of each sheet of paper to explore the relative transparency and intensity of inks when accumulated. The finished image was a composite landscape made of many scales, vantage points, and styles of rendering. I 
I had tried to create in each landscape a place which reflected my own memory, or at least how I processed it in likeness or in sentiment. Then began to shuffle prints made before. I cut the printed landscapes in fragments, halves and strips to recycle the frames of an image and use place to frame place. As I reoriented these pieces, I put them through the printing press. The process called chincole bonds fibers of paper together. This process degrades the paper with each run through the press. With each time that I touched it, when I touched it, I distressed it, I cut it up. I collaged it back together with fragments belonging to something else, reappropriated to frame or contribute to place. Perspective plays an enormous part in how I render my landscapes. My perspective influences how I render place in relation to the body or the figure. It's a place rendered through mixed perspectives. The space between, which separates and distinguishes, has existed one way or another through my many processes. I render my landscapes differently because of how I process these differences. Windows frame, frame the space or passageway between two locations. A window frames the view of the other side and does not necessarily provide access. Looking at a mirror, I see a space that reflects my own. All rendered places look the same as distant and inaccessible. The ocean water and the sky are different hues of blue, but sometimes seem to mimic one another. Rocks change when land meets the water. It smooths and it shrinks. It dissolves and makes up sandy beaches. When land grows too high up, it becomes narrow and it freezes. Atmospheric perspective defines the sensation of atmosphere on distant land and objects. Our relative distance to objects defines our experience of place in both emotional or physical sensation and visual distortion. Atmospheric perspective defines the sensation of atmosphere on distant land and objects. Our relative distance to objects defines our experience of place in both emotional and physical sensation, as well as visual distortion. Far toward any horizon, atmospheric perspective makes the characteristics of place much less saturated or clear. The greater distance you are from somewhere within eye's reach, the more lucid your experience will be of the changes made by the atmosphere, such as lower saturation of colors and details and the graduated haze of blue. I'm interested in how the phenomenon of atmospheric perspective on place parallels our relationships to memories of place. Initially, the color blue felt inconsequential. After all, I had been working for the most part monochromatically in black and white. The color blue described distance and it reflected the distance I was feeling. Blue exists throughout art in many iterations. It has a long history within global trade, luxury, and privilege. This uncommon color was produced by a variety of pigments which were made from unique materials available to few countries. For many countries, there's a specific shade of blue that colors their visual culture. Egyptians, inspired by turquoise and lapis, invented a synthetic blue pigment made of silica, lime, copper, and alkali. A plant called woad was used to create a blue dye for textiles in the countries of England, Germany, and France. Ultramarine was made by grinding up the stone of lapis lazuli, which was used predominantly in Renaissance paintings. The Chinese used cobalt, which came from Persia. In an attempt to replicate cobalt, Portland blue was invented in England. My own relationships to countries of Japan and England and their respective colors of blue have tinted my memories. Visual culture and heritage has been a self-generative influence of my image cre creation. I consider what the human eye perceives as an element's relationship to time. We experience the vis visual sensation of bodies as water, as dynamic and perpetually in motion. Changes in the sky in the form of clouds or colors brought by the sun, while visually measurable, occur at a much slower pace when perceived by eyes. This planet rotates and orbits at a magnificent speed. 
The tectonic plates of rock which collide, crack, and shake are rarely visible in action. Earthquakes create a sensation of shaking which rattles our bodies, shaking our eyes, and becomes the shaking that we see. Imperceptible to human eyes is the exchange between water on land on coasts and the imperceptible shifts that produce visual changes in those materials. Water dissolves rock, smoothing it or crumbling it into smaller granules. Lightning from the sky can instantly shatter a tree. We can look at a three-dimensional world and our sense of object permanence allows us to make sense of what visually overlaps. Sometimes we can imagine what the rest of something looks like based on our experience of that thing. And I wanna make the distinction that this experience can be subjective as it's not coming from a, pers a scientific perspective. Though the study of these elements has brought much of the knowledge that we know now, this is strictly from a visual perspective and that the visual perspective comes from me and my cumulative biases brought by the influence of these divergent cultures and their visual languages. In this exercise, I came closer to finding the visual vocabulary, which communicated my relationship to place in composing frames from previously printed landscapes, that the experience of place can be contextualized by the places experienced before it or around it. And while I believe personal lives are connected to greater narratives of communities, geography, and ecology, I cannot comfortably speak with detached authority about things that are difficult to assign words. I make to process with art a visual language and communicate things less concrete and less tangible. I write excerpts, fragments of these attempts to get closer. However, boundaries from culture to culture are not well-defined or fixed in the era of globalization. I'm still processing old patterns. Discourse centered around the identification and preservation of heritage formed the kind of cultural education I received in all of my host countries. In response to overarching narratives of pride and nationalism post 9-11, I tell the story of an individual's uncertainty with multicultural heritage, both tangible and intangible. Many children of immigrants find difficulties in accessing parts of their parents' past life before they came from here to there, wherever here may be or there may be. It's not often that this influence would manifest in explicit ways. Something that comes to my mind was my mother's reluctance to teach us her dialect, Visayan, or the national language of the Philippines, Tagalog. Blending in felt like a primary objective wherever I was. In my adult life, I dug hard to find the ways that my mother shared hidden parts of herself through her actions. It influences the things I thought, which became the things I write. And I responded to this by listing objects to you and audience I anticipate as heavily identifying with the possessions and the commercial ways that culture is expressed. This is also considered a grounding exercise to list what you notice around you. I'll begin. Home doors, windows, clocks, sky, harangue, MTV, porcelain vases from Japan, porcelain plates from England, Our Lord's Prayer framed above the dinner table, above the piano, dried fish, rice cooker, wicker couch, wicker chairs, wicker side tables, wicker coffee table. Crucifix, German entertainment unit made from wood, Pow, power transformers, reupholstering the wicker couch with colonial patterns, Kelpie, Coca-Cola, Toyomansi, sunbird tea, stir-fried squid tinted black from ink, pickled onions and carrots, kimchi, calling cards, corded phones, dial tones, tatami mat, home videos, Chicken in a crate, moth balls, bullock viands, nesting dolls, kokeshi dolls, cabbage patch kids, Pokemon, stickers, yakisoba, N64, sinigang, ribbons, bows, calendars, bingo, karaoke, fiestas, steamed buns, pandasol, lumpia, condensed milk candy. 
cassava cake, plastic tent, Disney, Sanrio, salted shrimp, salted eggs with gray yolks, perms, bobs with bangs, ruffled bangs, tabo, family portraits, tunelas, Mitzi, our first dog, PCS, TDY. And while the subject and content have mostly been consistent, the shifting variables have leaned towards scale and physical piecing and layering. This process naturally progressed from relatively small scale relief prints and illustrations of figures to increasingly large renderings of place. In building a visual language about my own divergent relationship to place, my understanding of the locations I had occupied and their own collective histories expanded my own processing. Alongside the series that you see in part at Rife were monotypes printed on fabric. This shape lives across so many people addressing topics of home, and this is my contribution, a view of the inside of the house's caricature. My earliest memories belong to a tent that I had when I was very little. To revisit this relationship, I began constructing my own by borrowing the likeness of that remembered structure. The shift is simply not in scale, but more so in my relationship to it as a safe space rendered temporary. These leaves were held to the interior with sewing needles, the sharp end pointed to the outside. An embroidery, although with materials more resistant to the process such as yarn and tool, is a repetitive and additive process that forces me to reorient my own mark making gestures. Instead of carving down, removing and impressing, I'm stitching and building up. The material is soft, reminds me of domestic processes that I've been surrounded by in my upbringing. And in this material, I feel closeness. This collection of fragments here have been touched by many hands as part of a larger project. Here, I have combined the process of embroidery and used it to filter an ink painting on muslin in a shadow box. As a military child, my experiences with shadow boxes signaled a milestone, most often a retirement and at worst a passing. In my box, I signaled the close of a specific period of my life. And the themes of my work have naturally led me to play in the world of installation. This was the first time I tried filtering space with prominent cultural symbols mentioned in my childhood. I combined the transparent and smooth material tool painted with India ink to tint the fibers and stitched opaque and textured embroideries with yarn. My own experiences had driven me to put in place filters which intersect space and bring interference instead of visual clarity. This was installed for people to walk through and stand in proximity to others, their bodies bringing the curtain-like filters to sway. As an image maker before this time, I needed many hands to make this happen. It had occurred to me here how valuable community can be in working toward a unified goal or toward members of your community. And here I have a before and after of the four foot by eight foot board I used to make monotypes that were made alongside the reframed series. The image on the left is something called a key, which is an image I used. Every time I applied ink to this piece of wood, I responded to this key. The entire process of inking and printing took place on the ground. The scale, weight, and instability inherent in a single piece of plywood made working in any other orientation difficult. Accessing parts of the plywood for inking required leveraging my body against itself or an excuse and balance altogether to avoid touching fresh ink on the edges. Printing at this scale required full body contact with the surface. The image on the right is the result of 16 prints on silk fabric. The polyurethane I used to treat the surface of this board retained ink from every print. The darkest areas show where the most ink had been applied. After about 16 prints, the relative thickness of the ink and its application on the board became increasingly difficult to measure. Layers of stain accumulated from past prints which made the process of inking more intuitive for me. I relied on my memory once more of past prints to inform the direction of new prints that I can no longer see in process. 
each printed image with its gradual and predictability became an exercise in muscle and material memory. Silk textile is used to make items meant for close proximity to the body. It's breathable in that air can pass through and that many applications of this fabric embrace that feature. In this semi-transparent, appearing more see-through when you stand parallel and opposing beside it, this orientation responds to your body. When layered or at an angle, the visual read of the threads compress and its transparent qualities are reduced. The fabric appears more opaque and when printed, the printed content becomes crisper and clearer. When the intensity or source of light changes, the effect can be the opposite. At night, silk curtains filter the view of inside and eliminates the view of what is outside. To see these prints clearly, you must be positioned skewed with the silk receding away from you, because when you're directly in front of it, it appears more distant or less clear. These silk monotypes belonged to another reimagining of that tent space to be put together, to be taken apart and reoriented again. I don't think it was ever meant to be seen as a stable or fixed structure. In fact, each time that it was displayed, there was a reorientation. It's knotted together to be untied and soft enough to be folded up and transported in a handheld box. It's a place for bodies to pass by. It stands as a passage or filter to the rest of the space it occupies. The gentle air currents from people passing by, doors opening and closing, wind from the outside or the air conditioner cause the silk to sway. If a person briskly walks past it, the silk waves like water. And here I have an example of its response to ambient air. Before I close out my extended show and tell, I thought I would share with you all some recent changes in my ways of working. This recent and rapid shift in our way of life has challenged what it means to make and share art with others. As someone whose practices have heavily relied on a community presence, my time in the studio rarely alone as a printmaker, I have sought ways of rekindling a connection. My immediate community here in Ohio and a distant community in Oklahoma, Missouri, and other states had become equally distant this last year. It's not as simple as it used to be just stopping by to chat. And like many others, my response to this was exchanging mail. These snapshots of previous and ongoing collaborations displayed to count my blessings and make visual the essential human connection and community I have initiated a series of primary visual exchanges by hand, snail mail, and digital formats to connect with those who I consider touchstones to my distant and webbed community of makers. The selection of artists named with me in an upcoming exhibition are those who have impacted my sense of belonging and meaning making as one who has repeatedly constructed home away from home. Each piece has been touched by someone who has created for me a sense of inclusion and support, many of whom live between my two most recent homes, although not exclusively. And for me, it's been an opportunity to connect once more, to initiate play and making with others when it feels especially difficult to do so. In the work I'm making now, everything will have been touched by more than myself, like plenty of my work before. And that is all I have prepared for you. Uh, thank you again for being here. I look forward to any questions you might have. All right, let's see here. Um, so let's see here. Uh, Gloria, the, what I really found um, interesting about 
listening to how you work is that you're really turning on ear the idea of traditional printmaking. So really questioning um, the, the practice of additioning. All of your works, what I, what I thought was really interesting is that like you, you can't have an addition of the works that you're working in now because they're so transient. And I use that word really um, intentionally. Could you talk a little bit about why um, or when you made that kind of change from the traditional printmaking methods to this um, ethereal nature of really um, embracing impermanence? and change? Well, I think that before I even got into uh, making prints, a lot of the work I made was just initial drawings. And I found that um, even in my processing of drawings that um, it kind of, like I found myself drawing a lot of the same things. And so when I was working, or as I found or came to find print as a medium that could, I mean, address the rep repetitive nature of the way that I um, process these images, I, I found that uh, even in the repetition, there was a lot of uh, a, like it was more concrete, like there was the, at least in relief printmaking, the repetitive nature of that and being able to return to an image, although very helpful. Um, I found wanting more out of that, especially since I knew for a fact that memories are not that way, like you are not receiving or thinking of the same thing every time you remember something. And so I felt that as much as I loved relief, I had to find other ways of printmaking that uh, addressed not only the transient na nature of remembering and how we process thought and build on the ways that we, I guess, remember and think. I, I began working on yeah, monotypes and uh, varied editions and screen printing. I worked with collage to kind of explore that. And I think that it felt very natural to go through that because even as I was working on relief, I found myself drawing and collaging onto that. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting away from the original point, but yeah, I, I think that I've always tried to embrace the idea of impermanence in, in the way that I process my imagery. Um, and even within processes that, you know, require consistent repetition um, and craftsmanship being like a major component of that, especially in relief, um, I found myself responding to that in, in other ways through monotypes. Yeah, it, printmaking is such a, a structured um, and really detailed way of, of conveying imagery. Um, I just, I really enjoy the fact that you turn it on its ear. You know, you, you're using, utilizing and pushing it in, in another direction. We have another question. Mm -hmm. um, you described a feeling of otherness, particularly in relationship to cultural and artistic gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. Now as an art educator, how has um, the role changed? Let's see here. How has the role changed your understanding of gatekeeping and your relationship to power? Well, I found that because a lot of my work is in visually informed by what I would consider low forms of art, like, or not, I mean, I guess like this is evolving, this is ever changing, but lower forms of art, like uh, cartoons and comics and craft, which is now being elevated or has continuously become elevated. I find that I've always already had this perspective that art can be anything. And I find that especially when I'm trying to use art as a way to communicate and use it as a language to communicate things that maybe don't have words as easily. Um, I'm trying to find ways, especially as an educator to, and I guess coax that out of my 
my class of, you know, of individuals who may not actually have very many tools, visual tools to communicate what they have historically been able to communicate with words, or maybe they haven't tried to communicate these complicated or difficult, um, I don't know, like feelings or experiences. And so I think that, yes, my background in some of the more traditional printmaking processes, I, I love it as a technique and as a craft, but I've always come from a place of idolizing uh, the, the not so high forms of art. Like even as a printmaker, I struggle to call myself a printmaker's printmaker. <laughs> um, we have another question. Does your process of experimenting with collage and excess print materials replace or mimic the more traditional process of sketching? Yes. Uh, and then I think a lot of it has to do with just how I process. Um, even when I think about what a sketch does for me, I've never been much of a planner. I've never laid out entire uh, compositions or come into a block knowing exactly how it's going to turn out. There's always a mystery. There's always an unknown in my processing, um, especially as it relates to printmaking. And even as I collage, like, yes, this is something that I use as a, an exercise to sketch out compositions and sketch out relationships. But um, it never, it doesn't ever go to like bigger works, like it ends up being its own thing. And so I find that even in my sketching, um, I am reactive and I'm embracing the full like capacity of what those materials are and not intending for them to translate to the larger scale to become something else. Right. All right. Here's another one. Uh, it seems like you have such an intimate connection to the relationship of person to place and the concept of rootedness or lack of roots. I'm wondering if your work has become your roots or given you a uh, more sense of yourself and your place in the world. Oh yeah, I've not, who, oh. <laughs> I think that's hard because I definitely, I made the work uh, to proclaim, I have no roots, like that's essentially where <laughs> where the work came from. And uh, I found that in making that work and eventually being able to engage with other communities of people who have similar sentiments, I find that separate from the work, I am able to kind of establish a sense of rootedness, although the roots kind of float, like they're not really grounded in anywhere in particular, but um, at least in my making, I, I do try to imagine um, how, how a sense of rootedness could feel um, if you embrace that transience as part of it. Um, and that maybe roots don't necessarily have to stay um, deeply embedded in one location, but could in fact be large and webbed and yeah. Great. Um, at the very beginning, you said a word um, that I'd like for you to talk a little bit more about, uh, nagandom, which okay. you described as sadness and, and longing. Yes, yeah, and so I think before you go into that, I, I think it's very apparent to me that you're creating works that uh, can imbue a sense of longing and sadness but also have this uh, calm within them, this meditative, like you can, you can be with them and feel uh, really calm within, within that presence. So I'd love to hear more about this particular word, where it comes from and how you um, think about that within the works that you create. Well, this word actually came from a an extended search of, uh, I guess, words that don't, I, like, that articulate experiences that were not present in my dominant cultural 
uh, upbringing. So being raised as a predominantly English speaker, um, I, I had a really hard time giving words to uh, these really difficult to access feelings or experiences. And so as I was searching for the vocabulary um, as related to these experiences, I found that this is actually a cross-cultural thing. Um, there's so many words that exist out there that, I mean, I'm currently struggling to come to with what those are, but so many of these words do exist um, that connect to a sense of rootlessness or to a specific feeling that is difficult to grapple with or is inaccessible. And when I found this word, it was speaking directly to the experiences of uh, a mixed cultural identity of Filipinos um, and also uh, how the uh, diasporic condition of like the Filipino bodies, like as they are spread all across the world, um, there is this very uh, common sense of longing and distance and sadness that um, maybe isn't so much being articulated by those experiencing it, but um, it finds ways of being articulated, especially as uh, a child of a Filipino immigrant, um, the not so explicit ways that she or my mother had um, expressed that to me. And so to have, um, at least when I read that word and I read um, a lot about these experiences, these mixed experiences, um, being able to assign a word to what um, I had a hard time pinpointing was the secondhand experience of my mother was kind of refreshing um, and calming and consoling, but also like horrific to think that, yeah, like you had to give it a name. And so, uh, yeah. I just, I kind of gravitated to that word and maybe in the way that it reflects in my work is more so I've heard wistful in, in the description of my work um, and how it does kind of come from this heavily conflicted and uh, maybe emotive place of longing, but um, it's also coming from my environment and how that environment is being uh not maybe environment but like the people in my environment how their energy is like shared with me so all right we're getting we're getting um close to time but i think it's really important to kind of tie back in um this exhibition erica was really thoughtful about who and how she selected the artists. Of course, there are so many artists that are really wonderful and doing great things within communities, but I'd like for you to chat a little bit about uh, how you create community, because I mean, it's very apparent within the work that you make the importance of it, but the in the, uh, the actual practice uh, outside of artwork, could you talk a little bit of, about that? Yeah, uh, so I think, well, as it relates to Erica's uh, interest in me, I think that connected more with my involvement with uh, a St. Louis uh, based artist project uh, called the Filipino American Artist Directory. Uh, this project was started by Jonna Langholtz and through her, I had an opportunity to uh, engage with a community of folks who more or less had similar, um, if not the same issues that I am experiencing. Um, I had the privilege of assisting Jana with this project for just over a year. And my experience with this project had encouraged me to overcome a lot of my shy and reserved nature, um, to reach out to other Filipino American artists and contribute to a sense of community between them. So. Um, I was often the uh, uh, the primary contact for a lot of people and finding ways with Jana to 
um, involve and connect all of them together. So just being an active member in that community has been uh, a large contributor to how I engage with almost every other community since then. Um, being a printmaker, a lot of my uh, a lot of my time in the studio is in a communal environment, maybe more so back then than now, but uh, print shop culture heavily relies on the presence of other bodies, uh, sharing a space, sharing the facilities and constantly being in conversation with people in process. Very little actually happens. Like once the work is finished, very little conversation actually happens until it's on display, but when you're in the process of making something, you're always, always sharing, always sharing and always communicating. And I think that um, then also that connects to maybe just like my background in general, like my background frequently uprooting, I find that um, my, my MO, my motive more now than ever is to quickly engage and quickly uh, become part of. And so, um, being able to access like every opportunity to go out and meet new people and start conversations um, and just spend time together, whether it's like for art related purposes um, has been, yeah, like that's been a, a major motivation for me um, right. to do so. I think that that dovetails perfectly into the very last question we're gonna have, which is, um, you know, thinking about creating community and that a lot of what happens just in general in artist communities is inspiration. So what other artists are you inspired by? And or are there any materials or mediums that you're looking to explore with next? Um, I was really excited to see how you have really flipped it around with this new experience of living through COVID and finding ways to build community. So I'd, yes, what, what other artists and material, what are you looking for and in being inspired by? So I guess currently I'm inspired by two of my friends who are working um, right now, like they're actively working. One, one is uh, Callista Leon. She's uh, actually currently on display at the Beeler Gallery and she uh, is making all kinds of work based off of her experience uh, with uh, native orchid population in Australia and how that relates to uh, the communities in the area and then global communities and ecology. And then there's um, John Elaine Colts, who is the director of the Filipino American Artist Directory. And I have just been following her. Um, a lot of the work that she makes is photographic in nature, but she has this ongoing project where she wants to find all the Manilas, which is Manila is the capital of the Philippines, but find all the Manilas in the United States and visit them and kind of figure out their origin and their history. Um, a lot of them have like some sort of history tied to the Philippines. And I think that um, these, I mean, both of them work heavily in research. Uh, they may have research based practices and while my work heavily comes from an emotional place i'm very interested in research becoming a large part of what I do as well. That's great, this has been really lovely, um, thank you so much Gloria. I want to remind folks that our virtual programming, uh, we do record it and hold on to those recordings. So if you didn't get to catch the front of it, you'll be able to catch that later, no problem. And we also have other programs coming up that I hope you'll tune in for. Uh, thank you again, Gloria, so much for sharing your work and your journey with us. It was really wonderful. I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you to the legislature and governor's office who supports the Ohio Arts Council and allows the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery to exist and amplify artists' voices. Have a great day. Thank you.